We are going to be covering Acts chapter 23 today, um, but before we get into Acts chapter 23, we're going to go back and kind of um, look at a couple things that set the stage for what brought us to Acts chapter 23 in the first place. So we're going to jump over to Acts chapter 21 real quick. Uh, if you want, you don't have to turn there, but we're going to start off in 21 verse uh, 22, and what you'll see there is that um, Paul is following the instructions of the religious leaders of the Christian church at the time. He's following the instructions of the half-brother of, of Jesus, James, and the elders of the Christian church. They wanted him to do some things to kind of appease the, um, the Messianic Jews of the day. They knew that Paul had been doing some things. There were some rumors uh, going around about things that he had been doing or saying and teaching them to uh, not abide by the Jewish traditions and the Jewish laws. And so they wanted him to do a couple things to kind of readjust, right, to, to show that he is a true Jew. And when Paul does this, they, he has the seven days. He takes this this vow, and at the end of this seven days, essentially, things were going great. They were going just fine until some people started stirring up some trouble, and he ends up getting arrested, even though he was doing exactly what they told him to do. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read Acts chapter 21, verses 27 through 38 real quick, just to kind of set that stage. It says, The seven days were almost ended when some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul in the temple and roused a mob against him. Everywhere Paul is going, people are wanting to beat him up. <laughs> you know? And that's what's happening again here. So they, they see him there in the temple, they rouse a mob, and it says, They grabbed him, yelling, Men of Israel, help us! This is the man who preaches against our people everywhere and tells everybody to disobey the Jewish laws. He speaks against the temple and even defiles this holy place by bringing in Gentiles, which actually wasn't true. It says, for earlier that day, they had seen him in the city with Trophimus, a Gentile from Ephesus, and they assumed that Paul had taken him into the temple. It says, the whole city was rocked by these accusations and a great riot followed. So Paul was grabbed and dragged out of the temple and immediately the gates were closed behind him. I thought that that was pretty interesting that they're, they're starting this, this riot right in the middle of the temple. It's the outer gates. They grab him and drag him out and immediately shut the, shut the gates behind him. It's almost like the religious leaders didn't want... Um, they didn't want it to look like they were the ones causing all this problem whenever the Romans came around because the Romans are going to come around. We're going to see that here in a minute. And I don't think that they wanted that uh, on them so much, but it does come back around on them. It says, as they were trying to kill him, they weren't just trying to beat him up. They were literally trying to kill him. Word reached the commander of the Roman regiment that all of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately called out his soldiers and officers and ran down among the crowd. That's pretty interesting, right? This, if you think about the, the setup here, these Romans, they have command over all of, basically all of the known world at this time. They are the, by far, the biggest um, empire to ever exist. And they have control over each of these towns. Well, the Jews, they had their own systems, their own rules and regulations and stuff that they kind of abided by, but they still fell under the Roman rule. And so this commander, here's what's going on. Who knows what he's been told, but we're about to find out that, that we think that he was probably told something. So let's see what it says. He immediately calls out his soldiers, officers, and they run down, and they stop, uh, they stop the beating of Paul. Right? So, the commander arrests him. What would happen today if the cops show up, some dude's just getting absolutely annihilated in the street by a mob of people, and the cops show up and they're like, 
this must be the troublemaker, and they grab them and arrest them. What in the world? Doesn't make any sense, right? Doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But they arrest him. And, but keep in mind, this is a big, a big deal going on. Like, he was told the whole city is in an uproar. And so he's got to get this under control quickly. They arrest Paul. It says, the commander arrest him and ordered him bound with two chains, not just one. Paul must have just been jacked, you know, like you only put, you only put two sets of handcuffs on somebody that you're worried about them getting out of the one. <laughs> but it says, he asked the crowd who he was and what he had done. Some shouted one thing, some shouted another, and since he couldn't find out the truth in all the uproar and confusion, he ordered that Paul be taken to the fortress. So when I'm reading this, it reminds me of, hypothetically speaking, Ezra, if, uh, if a parent has multiple kids, right, and they come in, they hear all kinds of stuff going on and, and yelling and screaming and somebody's crying, somebody's still throwing punches and stuff. They're like, what's going on? And this one kid says this, the other one says this, the other one says, it's like, how are we supposed to manage this? What are, what are we supposed to do here? Like, all right, you're all getting punished. I don't know what to tell you, you know? But, <laughs> Ashley, yes. Um, but here, only Paul gets punished. It's so interesting. It's so interesting how this all plays out. And it says, Paul reached the stairs. The mob grew so violent that the soldiers had to lift him up on their shoulders to protect him. And the crowd followed behind shouting, kill him, kill him. They don't know what's even going on. All they know is they've got to get this guy. They don't know if he's a murderer. They don't know if he's a child molester. They don't know anything. All they know is... This whole group of people wants this dude dead, and they're trying to keep him alive until then. But what's interesting is when, when they got there in the first place, they show up. The Jews see everybody, the, the Roman soldiers coming, and they stop beating him. They're like, <laughs> wasn't me. I, did, I mean, I didn't do anything. But here, it all just starts to escalate again. And now... They're having to literally lift Paul on their shoulders just to get him out of there. So the fear that they had of these Roman soldiers then kind of dissipated, and their anger and their rage took back over. And they're still wanting to kill him. So much so that these soldiers are like, we got to move and we got to move now. So, then if we go over to verse 38. The commander, remember, the commander was asking, what did this dude even do? Why, why is all this going on? And he keeps hearing all this stuff, right? So it says, Paul was about to be taken inside, and he said to the commander, may I have a word with you? And the commander says, do you know Greek? He was surprised that Paul knew Greek. And he says, aren't you the Egyptian who led a rebellion some time ago and took 4,000 members of the assassins out into the desert? And Paul's like, no! Where did you even get that? The commander didn't even know that he could speak uh, Greek. He thought he was Egyptian. I Egyptians kind of looked a little different. I'm surprised. It makes me wonder what Paul looked like even. But then, a little bit, a little bit later, Paul asked, he asked if he can address the, uh, the crowd because he tells him that, no, he's a Jew and a citizen of Tarsus of uh, Cilicia, and he says, it's an important city. He says, please let me talk to these people. And the commander agreed. I'm sure he did agree. He's like, I'm still trying to figure all this out. You're not who I thought I was. Yes, please. By all means, go ahead. Paul stood on the stairs and motioned to the people to be quiet. And soon a deep silence enveloped the crowd. And he addressed them in their own language, which was Aramaic or, or Hebrew. So now the commander is probably like, Okay, even yet another language. All right, outstanding. In all of Acts 22, for the most part, all of Acts 22, Paul is giving his testimony to these people. Remember, this, this hush went over the whole crowd. He starts to give his testimony, 
which is the whole reason that he's there in the first place, right? To tell people the truth about Jesus Christ. And he's like, I've got all the city right here. I'm going to take this opportunity and I'm going to tell them what actually happened to me. So he starts to talk to them and he goes down and, and outlines uh, his encounter with Jesus on the, uh, the road to Damascus, right? Where God encounters him and, and he's knocked to the ground and he goes blind. He can hear God and all this stuff. And, and he goes through and, and outlines all this. But then the very last verse that I want to cover is verse 21 in chapter 22. It says, But the Lord said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. That was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. They're like, what? They, it just blew their mind. You've got to be kidding me. You know, this is our God. This isn't somebody else's God. You can't be taking our God to, to the Gentiles. They just, they just couldn't wrap their mind around it. And that just set them all off again, right? So then they all get upset whenever they've, they hear that he's been sent to the Gentiles. And then look down at verse 24 through 28 of, of Acts 22. It says, The commander brought Paul inside and ordered him lashed with whips to make him confess his crime. He's listening to all this and he's still just like, What? Beat this guy. Get, get the truth out of him. Like, let's figure out what this is because what he just said doesn't justify what's happening here. Something else has to be going on. And it says, he wanted to find out why the crowd had become so furious. When they, when they tied Paul down to lash him, Paul said to the officer standing there, is it legal for you to whip a Roman citizen who hasn't even been tried? Well, in our day and age, we're like, okay, you know, you're, you're getting some some punishment beforehand, but this was, this was bad news for the Romans that were getting ready to do this. They could themselves be extremely punished um, in, open, in the open public for doing this to a Roman citizen without a trial. It says, when the officer heard this, he went to the commander and asked, what are you doing? This man's a Roman citizen. So the commander went over and asked Paul, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And Paul says, yes, I certainly am, Paul replied. Well, the commander already knew this. We just went over this. He had already had this, this conversation with him. Look back at... Um, yeah, in verse uh, chapter 21, verse 37, Paul's about to be taken inside, and he said to the commander, may I have a word with you? Do you know Greek? The commander asked, and he was surprised. He, he says, aren't you this Egyptian guy? And Paul says, no, I'm a Jew, a citizen of Tarsus, of Cilicia. He already told him, <laughs> I'm a citizen. But apparently the commander had the, the memory that Rod was talking about, about this big, and forgot because of all the, the stuff that was going on. So anyway, he... Uh, he mutters to himself, he starts talking about how he had to pay for his own citizenship, and Paul's like, well, I was born a Roman citizen. I didn't have to pay for it, I didn't buy it, it's mine by birthright. And so that kind of got him out of a little bit of, of hot water. However, I do find it interesting that at this point, the commander's heard all this stuff. He has no proof of anything going on that's illegal whatsoever, yet he still holds him in prison or in jail, essentially. And the commander orders a meeting with the, lead, the leading priests and the Jewish high council in Acts 22, verse 30. It says, the next day. So he kept him overnight. He's like, I have dinner to get to. We're going to keep you here. You don't get to do, go anywhere. I have plans tonight. My wife expects me home. And so you're just going to have to sit here for a little while. So the next day, the commander ordered the leading priest into session with the Jewish high council. He wanted to find out what the trouble was, uh, was all about. So he released Paul to have him stand before them. So he's holding him overnight. He says, I got to figure this out. I'm calling this meeting. 
which the Jewish high priest and the council actually said, okay, yeah, we'll go to that, because remember, they're under that authority. And he kind of, he lets Paul supposedly free, lets him out and says, you got to come to this meeting too. We're going to figure this out. It's almost like he's putting him out as bait. Remember the last time that the commander just had Paul with these people? They were following him saying, kill him, kill him. And he's like, we're going to set you out here, see if we can get this figured out. <laughs> it just seems pretty interesting to me. So now we get into Acts chapter 23. Paul, what we've seen so far throughout Acts is Paul does what God tells him to do, gets arrested, gets beaten, gets in trouble, gets out, is obedient, does it again, gets beaten, gets arrested, gets out. I mean, it's a, it's a pattern here, right? But he has this conviction that he has to do what God has called him to do. He has to. There is no other option. Even if he dies doing it, he has to do what God has called him to do. I love that about Paul. He's determined. He's what my wife would call a strong-willed person. Then it says in verse 20, or chapter 23, verse 1, it says, Paul, in, um, gazing intently at the high council, Paul began, Brothers, I have always lived before God with a clear conscience. I understand that some different translations um, put that a little bit differently. However, I love that it uses the same verbiage as it does in Acts chapter 3, verse 6, whenever Peter and John were seeing the, uh, the lame man crippled at the gate beautiful. It says that they gazed at him intently. They purposefully looked at him. He was just begging. But, but God had put on their heart that I want you to do something with him. So they were gazing at him intently. And this is what Paul's doing as well. The same look, it's the same description, the same look. He's looking at the, the priest and the religious leaders. And he's getting ready. So before he had the crowd, all of, all of Jerusalem there, basically. And he's giving his testimony to them. And he's probably thinking, I can change, I can change all of Israel, you know, by by this testimony. But it didn't work out so well, right? They still tried killing him. Well, now he goes from having just the, the basic people of, of Jerusalem there to having all of the, the high council, the high priest and everything. And if he's going to literally make a lasting impact on Israel and God's chosen people, the Jews, for forever, this could be it. This is his opportunity to truly get to the heart of these people, to help them understand and persuade them just like he's done at all of these towns throughout all of his travel. That's all he's been doing is trying to, it has been, the word says he proved to them that Jesus was the Messiah through the Old Testament, through the Gospels, or, or through, through the word of God. He proved it to them. Well, now he has all the leading priests, the high council, sitting right there. And now is the time. It says, he tells them that he's always lived before God with a clear conscience. Now, I want to tell you, he's not trying to say that he's never, he's never sinned, that he hasn't done anything wrong. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying that he now has a clear conscience and that he's always been... Um, a person to follow the law so that he could have a clear conscience. But look at, look at how he opens this up. He says, brothers, I've always lived before God with a clear conscience. Well, that brothers that he states, that, guys, I'm telling you, that's like going in in a court case. You're being tried for something, and you go up before the judge whenever you should say, your honor, may I speak or whatever. Instead, you go in and you say, hey, brother, um, listen, you're not getting off to the right foot here. <laughs> you know, he's putting himself on equal plane with uh, the high council. He's putting himself kind of in this, yeah, 
basically an equal playing ground. But that's probably not the best opportunity to do it. It's not the best place to do it for sure. So it says um, some theologians said that the, the appropriate address would be rulers of the people and elders of Israel. That's how you would normally address this, uh, this group of people. So his statement, whenever he says that he's always lived before God with a good conscience, he didn't mean that he was sinless or perfect. Um, but what he's saying here is, and we can, kind of, we can kind of get an understanding of it if we look at 1 Corinthians 4, verse 4. He says, For I know nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. Right? So... He wasn't trying to say that he lived a sinless and perfect life. That wasn't what he was doing. But Ananias, the high priest, gets a little bit out of shape about this comment that he just made and, and the way that he makes it in. And it says, instantly Ananias, the high priest, commanded those close to Paul to slap him on the mouth. All right. Um, but Paul said to him, God will slap you, you corrupt hypocrite. What kind of judge are you to break the law yourself by ordering me struck like that? That's pretty, pretty significant. I, I think that, uh, that one version says, uh, it's probably the NIV. Sorry, I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. But one says, um, calls him a whitewashed wall. <laughs> you know, he's like, you, you're, you're telling these people to slap me? Like you're just a whitewashed wall, you hypocrite. You're standing there breaking the law by telling them to slap me, which is also breaking the law. And let me, let me point out where it, um, where it talks about that. So it says, uh, this order was illegal for the Jewish law said, he who strikes the cheek of one Israelite strikes as it were the glory of God, and he that strikes a man strikes the Holy One. So Ananias, he was the high priest at the time, but he didn't honor the office that he had. He didn't, he didn't view it honorably, obviously. This is just one, one singular incident, but apparently he was known uh, for his greed, the ancient Jewish historian uh, Josephus actually recorded that, um, that Ananias was known for stealing for himself the tithe that belonged to the common priest. This was a, a known thing. He used violence and assassination to further his interests. That's, pretty, that's a pretty significant claim. You know what I mean? This guy is obviously using his position of authority to, uh, to benefit himself. And it reminds me of, of Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas. These, these two would just do whatever they felt like doing, even though they were priests by God, literally called to take care of the people. And this guy, Ananias, is, is essentially doing the same thing. So Paul's, Paul's response uh, whenever he... He says, uh, he says, God will strike you, <laughs> you whitewashed wall. I like the whitewashed wall better. God will slap you, you corrupt hypocrite. What kind of judge are you to break the law yourself by ordering me struck like that? Those standing near Paul said to him, do you dare insult God's high priest? So Paul had been away for a little while. Um, so it is, it's understandable that he might not realize that Ananias actually is the high priest. So he had been away for, for a long time at this point. Um, I, I put it in my notes somewhere. I'll get to it. But thinking about how this conversation is going, how it's starting off, wouldn't it be interesting if we knew how Paul said, said this, how he's, he's going off on him? I, I envision it as kind of an outburst almost like a, an outburst of anger or rage or something, uh, and even if it's what he considers to be justifiable anger, right? Or he could have said it in a calm, collected rebuke, which would have 
struck even harder probably to Ananias himself. But whatever this, this tone that he uses, it really was accurate. It was according to the way that Ananias acted and probably justifiable. But the man who commanded um, that a defenseless man be punched in the face was obviously this whitewashed wall. And, and uh, commentators call it a, like a white veneer of purity covering over obvious corruption. You know, he was getting away with things just by who he was, but nobody else would get away with that kind of junk, you know? He sits there and, and Paul exposes Ananias' hypocrisy because he's on trial for supposedly breaking the law, and this guy's literally breaking the law right there. You can find the, the actual um, the law there in Deuteronomy 25, verses 1 through 2. But it also says that um, only a man found guilty can be beaten. And Paul had not yet been found guilty of anything. Paul goes, uh, through his rebuke, he says that God will strike you. This is prophetic. Even though he's, he's speaking out in, in a situation where Paul knows the people that he's standing in front of right now are the ones that literally crucified Jesus, crucified his Messiah. There is a significant weight behind their words and their condemnation. If they convict him, he's probably going to get murdered, brutally tortured and tormented and murdered. But... <clears throat> he speaks out and he says, God will strike you. So these were a little more prophetic than what he probably realized because apparently according to uh, some Jewish laws or some Jewish writings, it says that Ananias' final days, despite all of his schemings and bribes, were lived as a hunted human and later um, became, because of his pro-Roman politics, Ananias was brutally killed by Jewish nationalists. So it's interesting the things that we do find documented down in Scripture and the things that we've got to look other places for, you know, to find other historical facts. But I think that stuff like that is pretty relevant to things like this, you know. We hear what's happening with Paul. We hear what's happening with the other disciples and stuff. But what happened to the people that did those things? And here we get to hear a little bit about it. But... He did probably think that his outburst, later on, whenever he was thinking about it, he probably thought that this outburst was maybe not the best thing to do because um, we will see over, I believe it's in Acts 24, Paul is actually talking about how he's like, well, maybe what I said probably wasn't the best way to put it, essentially, is, is kind of how he lays it out. But he did know that he was instantly wrong about his outburst no matter how he said it because he did agree that what he what he said he shouldn't have said because he says i'm sorry brothers i didn't realize he was the high priest paul replied for the scriptures say you must not speak evil of any of your rulers paul realized that some members of the high council were sadducees and some were pharisees so he shouted brothers i'm a pharisee as we my ancestors and I am on trial because my hope is in the resurrection of the dead. This was a strategic move by Paul, 100%, 100% strategic, and very well played. I, I would have to say well played, Paul. He, um, but before we get into that, it is, it is kind of reasonable to think that Paul didn't know that, um, that Ananias was the high priest because... He had been away from Jerusalem for at least 20 years, if not more. And so things could have changed. Obviously, the high priest did change at this. And, and he also possibly didn't know because his eyesight wasn't great. And we, we find that in Galatians 4, 14 through 15 and 6, uh, Galatians 6, verse 11. It talks about Paul having bad eyesight. So... 
he may not have been able to see if the if he's talking to the high priest the high priest is going to have all the priestly garb on most likely unless like there was some extenuating circumstances that he didn't but he most likely did and so he may he might not have seen it and other other people think that Paul was just being sarcastic with the idea that I didn't think anyone who acted in such a manner could be the high priest I I don't know. Due to, due to some of Paul's past um, experiences, maybe, maybe that is true. I don't know. And we, like I said, we can't get the tone of his voice here, but it's possible. So, as he goes on and he talks about how he's a Pharisee, and a Pharisee of Pharisees, he says earlier, but he says, I'm on trial because of the resurrection of the dead. This statement isn't entirely incorrect, and it's not, it, it's not incorrect, actually, at all. But if you break it down, he's preaching about the Messiah, who was born a virgin birth, who lived a sinless life, who was murdered for our sins, and on the third day rose again, the resurrection. And without that resurrection, the whole teaching of of Jesus Christ is pointless. It's absolutely pointless. So it is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is about resurrection. But Sadducees, so they had the Pharisees there and the Sadducees, and the Sadducees were kind of the theological liberals of their day, and they denied the, the reality of life after death and the concept of resurrection. Luke rightly wrote of them, uh, saying the Sadducees that there is no resurrection and, and no angels, no spirits, anything like that. Well, it's interesting that we have these two different groups of people that come together on this one thing because typically they're bitter enemies. They're bitter enemies. And it's interesting that they can unite over this one thing. They unite in opposition against Jesus. They all came together then, and they're uniting in the opposition to Paul, Who's preaching Jesus? But other than that, they have almost nothing in common, right? They just want Paul to shut up. It is, it's interesting, I think, that and strange how people with nothing in common will come together as friends to oppose God and His work. We see the same thing today. People can be totally against each other, on every other platform, on every other thing. But if it has to do with God, the one true God, the living true God, they will come together to oppose you. I've said it before, and you guys have probably heard it before, that you can be talking about any other God, any other deity, right? Muhammad or Buddha or whatever. It doesn't matter. Nobody's feathers get ruffled. Until you say, Jesus Christ. Boom. Is that not odd? You know? It's because Satan goes, No! You can say anything else you want, but you will not use that name. You've got to silence that person. You've got to silence that group. You've got to silence that church. Don't let them speak that name. I don't care what other name they speak. Because none of those other names mean anything. None of those other names have power. Sorry, I'm about to go. I'm about to go. <laughs> All right. So, Paul's talking and he talks about how he's on trial for the resurrection of the dead. And it says, this divided the council. The Pharisees against the Sadducees, for the Sadducees say there is no resurrection or angels or spirits, but the Pharisees, uh, the Sadducees say there is no resurrection of angels or spirits, but the Pharisees believe in all of these. So there was a great uproar. Some of the teachers of religious law who were Pharisees jumped up and began to argue forcefully. We see nothing wrong with him, they shouted. Perhaps a spirit or an angel did speak to him. So as the conflict grew more violent, the commander was afraid they would tear Paul apart, so he ordered his soldiers to go and rescue him by force and take him back to the fortress. All right, here we go, back to jail again. 
You're about to get torn apart by this crowd. And think about the commander here. Like yesterday, he's seeing people that are rioting over one word, Gentiles. Paul says, I've been sent to the Gentiles. and It all blows up. And today, they all get all bent out of shape about one word, and that's resurrection. He's probably going, what is up with these Jews? Like, they get so bent out of shape about nothing. He can't wrap his mind around it, right? So he's like, take him back to jail. Um, we will deal with this in a little bit. <clears throat> but he says, or the word says in 23 verse 11, it says, That night the Lord appeared to Paul and said, So the Lord appeared to Paul and said, Be encouraged, Paul, or be of good cheer. Just as you have been a witness to me here in Jerusalem, you must preach the good news in Rome as well. Man. This is one of those times where we kind of just jump over this real quick. You know? We're like, oh, cool. Um, the Lord appeared to him, but did he really appear to him? Um, I don't know, so I'm just going to keep moving on. Luke writes, the Lord appeared to Paul in jail that night. People, whenever they're bold and courageous, fearless during the day, the night of loneliness finds the strength spent, and the enemy is never slow to take advantage of that. Look at the first thing he says that God says to Paul whenever he appears to him. Be encouraged. Be of good cheer. He's like, I'm in jail again. I know. Paul had to be getting somewhat discouraged, thinking I had this opportunity with the Israelites, or with um, the people of Jerusalem. Then I had this opportunity with the leaders, and everybody wants me dead. Everybody. He's in jail alone. He didn't have anybody else with him this time. It's just him. That's got to be hard on people. It's got to be hard on him. It does. Yeah, we're like, well, it's Paul. He's this great, you know, great figure. He can handle it. He's a human, just like me and you. If you kept getting thrown in prison for doing something that you knew God told you to do, and it was right, it wasn't wrong, wouldn't that be defeating? It had to have been. So I, I don't know what Paul was feeling at this point. But if God felt that it was important for him to show up there and say, be encouraged, be of good cheer, you got more of this coming, <laughs> he, he probably wasn't in a great spot in his mind, mentally, emotionally. But the Lord stood by him. Jesus' physical presence, I feel like, Jesus' physical presence was a unique manifestation in this time. But Jesus promised every single one of us. In Matthew 28, verse 20, he promised every single one of us that he would always be with us. We don't always see him. We don't always even feel him. We don't always hear him. But we, we know by his promises that he doesn't leave us and he doesn't forsake us. We can trust and take him at his word that he's there. He's happened to show up in the room with Paul. Cool. It's like I, I want God to show up in the room with me, but I really don't necessarily want to be in Paul's circumstances to have it happen. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But we do have to be careful what we ask for. Jesus knew where Paul was. He had not lost sight of Paul. I think that that's very, very important. So um, going through commentary, there was a story of Paul Bunyan, or John Bunyan, not Paul Bunyan, totally different guy. Um, Joel Bunyan, who wrote the, the Pilgrim's Promise. Lots of you have probably read that or at least heard of it. So he was in jail. John Bunyan was in jail. And a man visited him and said, Friend, the Lord sent me to you, and I have been looking in half the prisons in England for you. John's reply was this. He says, I don't think the Lord sent you to me, because if he had, you would have come here first. God knows I've been here for years. I, I can't argue with that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like... That's true. God knows where you are today. Even if you're hiding it from everyone else, God knows where you are. 
And God knew exactly where Paul was. And he had had some interesting stuff for him. So where he says, be encouraged, or your, some versions, a lot of versions say, be of good cheer. I like the be of good cheer as, uh, as well. But it says this five times, this, this exact quote, be encouraged, says it five times in the New Testament, each by Jesus. And I'm, I'm going to remind you of, of these times. I think that it's pretty important. Jesus told the bedridden paralytic, Son, be encouraged, your sins are forgiven. In Matthew 9, verse 2. He told the woman with the, uh, the 12-year bleeding problem, He said, be encouraged, daughter, your faith has made you well. In Matthew 9, verse 22. In Matthew 14, verse 27, Jesus told His Frightened disciples on the Sea of Galilee, be encouraged, it is I, do not be afraid. He told his disciples the night before his crucifixion, in this world you will have trials and tribulations, but be encouraged, I have overcome the world. And then here in Acts 23 verse 11, he tells Paul to be encouraged. These people were all going through very significant things. And you know how whenever you have a friend or a loved one, a family member, or even just somebody that you come in contact with, that they haven't been having the best of times. Maybe they've been going through something really hard, really difficult, and you just don't know what to say. I don't immediately go to, hey, be encouraged. Things are going to be all right. You know, I don't. Um, I do try to encourage people, but this Jesus said it five different times to people that were in really, really, really bad times. But when they believed that, and they took a hold of that, their lives were changed. And some people changed the world with it. Look at Paul. Look at what Jesus tells Paul. He says, that night the Lord appeared to Paul and said, Be encouraged, Paul, just as you have been a witness to me here in Jerusalem. You must preach the good news in Rome as well. To me, it seems like the only thing that he could really be encouraged with is he knew he wasn't going to die in Jerusalem. He knew he had somewhere else to go. So that helped him push forward. It helped him push on, right? But... We also should know that he stayed in prison there for another two years before he got out. We know that he stayed at least two years in prison in Rome before he got his head cut off there. And he had probably about a year's worth of traveling due to shipwrecks and all that kind of junk in between then. So from that point where, where God met him in the room and said, be encouraged, he was still in prison for another at least minimum five years before he was put to death. Sometimes the things that we have to be encouraged about might not look super encouraging to the rest of the world. But we have a promise, we have a hope that even when we step from this world, we step into instant relationship with Jesus. We step into to be, uh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We step from that world to that world. There's no time in between. There's no suffering in between. You go from there to there. I mean, that's encouraging. People that don't know God don't have that promise, right? So he's, he's being imprisoned and Listen to what happens next. It says, The next morning a group of Jews got together and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. Wow. <laughs> they really didn't like him. There were more than 40 of them in this conspiracy, and they went to the leading priests and elders and told them, We have bound ourselves with an oath to eat nothing until we have killed Paul. I wonder how many of these guys starved to death. 
It doesn't say, but if they're a man of their word, they're probably still haven't eaten yet. <laughs> so, you and the high council should ask the commander to bring Paul back. So these, this group of people, they're trying to tell the high council what to do. That's pretty interesting, but I think the high council was uh, biting off on it as well. It says, you should ask the commander to bring Paul back to the council again. Pretend you want to examine his case more fully, and we will kill him on the way. However, they didn't know that Paul's nephew was in the crowd. His sister's son heard of their plan and went to the, to the fortress and told Paul. I, I think that it's pretty interesting that he was able to get in and have this conversation with Paul. Um, probably not similar to what we have today, obviously. But Paul called for one of the Roman officers and said, Take this young man to the commander. He has something important to tell him. So the officer did, explaining. Paul, the prisoner, you know, the guy that we've been trying to keep alive, he called me over and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. This next part I found a little odd. It says, The commander took his, uh, took his hand and led him aside and asked him, What is it you want to tell me? I, I just don't know why, Paul, why Luke would put in here that the commander took him by the hand. Um, that just seemed odd. Uh, maybe it's not odd, but to me... Like you have this commander, you've got this little boy, and we do know that Romans had sex slaves and stuff like that. So I'm hoping that it wasn't that, but I don't know why else Luke would put it in there. But Paul's nephew told him, some Jews are going to ask you to bring Paul before the high council tomorrow, pretending they want to get some more information. But don't do it. There are more than 40 men hiding along the way, ready to ambush him. They vowed to not eat or drink anything until they've killed him, and they're ready now, just waiting for your consent. The commander looks at him and says, Don't tell anybody that you told me this. He warned the young man. The young man, Paul's nephew, probably thought, There's more than 40 people ready to jump him. But... If you think about it, the Romans didn't allow the Jews to have any actual kind of weapons, nothing whatsoever. And so, how, how tough would these 40, maybe 50 people have to be to take on some Roman soldiers? The commander, though, his response is pretty significant here. Then the commander called two of his officers in order and ordered, get 200 Get 200 soldiers ready to leave for Caesarea at 9 o'clock tonight. And then he says, also, <laughs> take 200 spearmen and 70 mounted troops. Provide horses for Paul to ride and get him safely to the governor Felix. Then he wrote this letter to the governor. So I'll tell you the, the letter here in a minute. But we had maybe a little over 40 dudes that don't have any real weapons whatsoever. And this commander, to say he went overboard like, is kind of an understatement. It's like us having uh, some Somali pirate ships. They're fishing boats out there that they, they try to take down shipping vessels with, and then we have an entire naval fleet come after these Somali pirates. Like, <laughs> they're, they just simply don't stand a chance whatsoever, you know? It's like, wow, that's a lot of manpower. That's a lot of resources for maybe 40 or 50 people that don't really have any weapons, but maybe some slingshots and, and sticks. I don't know. But anyway, sorry, my mind, my mind just goes to these logistics. I'm like, what in the world? But I think it is fun that he did that anyway. <clears throat> so he writes this letter to um, Governor Felix. It says, from Claudius List. Uh, Lysias, to His Excellency, Governor Felix. I don't know if he had to write His Excellency, but man, if we talk like that today, that's pretty interesting. His Excellency, Governor Felix. Greetings. This man, he says, this man was seized by some Jews, and they were about to kill him when I arrived with troops. He, he makes himself sound like, hey, I knew, I got it, I'll take care of this. When I arrived with some troops, 
When I learned that he was a Roman citizen, I removed him to safety. He didn't say, and then I was getting ready to beat him again. <laughs> he, he didn't add that part in there. He's like, I, I got him to safety, don't worry. He says, then I took him to their high council to try to learn the basis of this accusation against him. I soon discovered the charge was something regarding their religious law, certainly nothing worthy of uh, imprisonment or death. But when I was informed of the plot to kill him, I immediately sent him on to you. I have told his accusers to bring their charges before you. This, the government, the people there to protect and maintain law and order. He does nothing. He just tells them, like, there's a plot to murder someone. If we have a plot to murder someone today, we've got an eyewitness of it that's obviously willing to testify. They brought the word to you. Something's going to happen. Like, these people are going to be held accountable. He's like, I didn't do anything about it. I just said, hey, you want to kill this guy? Take it to His Excellency, Governor Felix. He does nothing about it. I just find that so odd, you know? They even put his troops in danger. If it was a small contingent, you know, seven or eight people, 50 people might have overran them and could possibly kill his men. It just, the tactics just don't add up to me here. And he, he just literally does nothing about it. And for me, it's like, hey, guess what? If, he was will, if they were willing to do that to them, what says they're not going to do it again? You know, at least do something. So, in verse 31, it says, So that night, as ordered, the soldiers took Paul as far as Antip um, Antipatris. They returned to the fortress the next morning while the mounted troops took him on to Caesarea. So, at least he still had this entire contingent of 70 armed mounted soldiers taking him on the rest of the way. When they arrived in Caesarea, they presented Paul and the letter to Governor Felix, and he read it and then asked Paul what province he was from. Cilicia, Paul answered. And then he says, I will hear your case myself when your accusers arrive, the governor told him. Then the governor ordered him kept in the prison at Herod's headquarters. This, this just doesn't make any sense, man. So he stayed here in this prison at Herod's headquarters for at least two years. Then, like I said, two more in Rome um, with the travel time in between. But he says, I'll hear your case myself when they arrive. It's, it's literally victimizing the victim again. These guys want you dead for what we believe is no, no cause whatsoever but you're going to stay in prison until these people that have who knows what charges against you arrive on their own time whenever they feel like it. That just blows my mind. But what I love is that Paul finds opportunity in everything, good, bad, or indifferent. Paul's finding the opportunities. God meets with him in this cell, right, in jail, because Paul finds the opportunities in everything. We're going to find out a little bit later that Paul's ministering to, to these guys that he's constantly around. So he's, he's been sent to the Jews, and then he gets sent to the Gentiles, and then he's actually sent to the, the high priest and the council, and now he's getting to um, literally minister to all these Roman soldiers that are constantly with him. They're never not with him. I find that really interesting. In our worship this morning, our worship was, I, I thought it was great, and I'm honestly not trying to be biased because the worship leader is my wife and daughter, but look at these songs. Uh, these songs, they fit perfectly, in, and we did not play in this. I honestly don't even think that she knows what chapter I was going to be on, most likely, but these songs, this isn't the order, but it is well with my soul. We're talking about a dude that's being imprisoned for his faith.
faith in Christ and for trying to share the good news that people can be saved. But he's still in prison. But it's still well with his soul. He just told people earlier, a couple chapters earlier, I know you don't want me to go to Jerusalem because things are going to be bad. I'm going to get bound and tied and all this stuff. But even if I die, it's okay. It's okay. Don't, don't worry about it. It's fine. I'm ready. And then we have graves into gardens. God does, man. He takes these tough, difficult situations that all of us go through. We all have our own graves. We all have our own prison cells. We all have our own difficulties, our hard times. Mine might look different than yours, yours different than this. We all have them, though, don't we? And the God that we serve says, cast your cares on me. Cast your burdens on me. Take my yoke. Here, take this one. It's light. It's like, you know, a blow-up balloon or something. It just looks like a yoke. It's light. It's easy. Take it. I've got this for you. I'm going to take your struggles, and you get to walk in peace and freedom. You get to be lighthearted. You get to, you get to be joyful. I love that. Graves in the gardens. God changes these difficult situations that we have, and he turns them into beautiful, amazing things. People, think about how many people's lives were transformed, changed. People set free and delivered because of Paul's testimony. And a lot of it he wrote while he was imprisoned. We get to benefit from his heart that God gave him even while he was in prison. It changes lots of us. And then promises. The song is such an amazing song. But we have God's promises. And they are true. They are absolutely true. Promises to give you hope, to give you a future, prosper you not to harm you, that no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. He allows us to sit down and eat at a table in the presence of our enemies. Those are his promises. You may be surrounded, but it doesn't matter. When he's with you, who can be against you? You have his promises to stand on. And then the goodness of God. One of my favorite songs. Absolutely love that song. But the goodness of God. Like we quoted earlier, in this world, I believe it's the end of John chapter 16, the last verse. It's right around there. He says, in this world, you will have trials and tribulations. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Remember, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And I have been crucified with Christ. So it doesn't matter what comes. No matter what comes your way. You can hold fast. And you can rely on the fact that He is the Prince of Peace. He gives you the peace that surpasses all understanding. He is your strength. Your ever-present help in time of need. Your refuge. Your strong tower. He's everything you need and nothing that you don't need. Let's pray. Hmm. Good morning, Father. God, we love you so much. We thank you, Lord, for your promises. We thank you for your word and your truth. We thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ, your Son, who has delivered us from the hands of darkness and put us into his glorious light. Thank you, God, that you call us sons and daughters, that you call us heirs to the throne, that you have washed us as white as snow. You have purified us. You have made us your pure and spotless bride. You've cleansed us, you've redeemed us, you've renewed us, you've set us free. 
God, we love you and we thank you so much for that, God. Thank you for giving us your name. Thank you for making us in your image and in your likeness, God. Thank you for giving us the power to defeat hell and sin and the grave. Thank you, God, that you go before us and you fight our battles for us. Thank you that we can rest in you, that we find our hope in you. God, I pray that you will go before us today, that you will lead us and you will guide us, that you will keep us this week, Lord. I pray that you will expand our territory, Lord, and that we will have divine appointments and opportunities to be able to reach the world for you, God. I pray that we will take every opportunity, every chance that we get to share the good news, God. I pray that you will um, just make us bold, Lord, that you will make us exactly who you've called us to be, God. Help us to be obedient to your call on our lives. And whenever you speak, Lord, help us to move and do the things that you called us to do, regardless of what it looks like and regardless of the possibilities of the outcome. God, help us to reflect you and represent you well in every single thing that we do. And we pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.